This is my Bible. It is the Word of God and the will of God for my life. I am who the Word says I am. I am the righteousness of God in Christ. I'm where the Word says I am. I'm seated right now in the heavenly realms in the place of authority, dominion, and power. I have what the Word says I have. All the blessings of Abraham are mine. And I can do what the Word says I can do. I can do all things through Christ who gives me the strength. Today my mind is alert. My spirit is receptive. As I am taught the Word of God, my life is changed for the better. And I will never be the same again. Amen. You may be seated. If you would turn in your Bibles to John chapter 9, the Gospel of John chapter 9. And we're continuing to deal with what Jesus really said. And last Sunday we were in Luke. We dealt with the 10 lepers and how Jesus, all of them were healed as they heard and obeyed the command of Jesus to go and to show themselves to the priest. And only one of them, the Samaritan, the foreigner, the outcast, the one that the Jews looked down upon, only one of them came back to thank Jesus. John chapter 9, beginning in verse 1. Now as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, or teacher, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind. Who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? One of the early church fathers, his name was Tertullian. And one of the things that he wrote that has always stood out to me in the history of the church and theology, Tertullian said it is always dangerous to engage in speculation. And that people get into trouble, and they get into trouble with Scripture, and they get into trouble with the Word of God when they engage in speculation. You know, if the Word tells us, if it gives us the meaning, you get to the book of Revelation, if it says the seven lampstands represent the seven churches, guess what? That's what they represent. But there are some things that the Word of God doesn't deal with, doesn't answer. And so when we get into speculation, we get on dangerous treacherous ground. And a lot of people, they're always looking to blame someone else for whatever they're facing. They're looking to blame God. They're looking even to blame the devil. They're looking to blame mom or dad. And a lot of times in the midst of a situation, a problem, an issue, people are trying to figure out, well, what's the reason? What's the cause? You know, we can, if you're facing something in your life, maybe it's a financial situation, maybe it's a a health challenge, You know, we can sit around for weeks talking about the situation, talking about how bad the situation is, but you know what? There's something that's better and far more productive, and that is to talk about what the answer is and what the solution is and what can change and turn the situation around. They said, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? See, they were looking for what? An explanation. And this needs to be something that is a warning to us in our own lives. When someone you know, someone who's around you, they face something in their life. Instead of talking about them or talking about their problem, their challenge, their difficulty, instead of giving your input about why they're facing what they're facing, maybe you ought to just pray for them instead. Maybe when you see them, you ought to encourage them instead and and cheer them on. And instead of saying, well, I think you did this wrong, I think you did that wrong, instead speak words of support and encouragement into their life and then tell them what the Bible says, that God, he's their savior, he's their healer, he's their deliverer, he's their blesser. The situation can turn around. Amen. Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents? That knowing the answer doesn't fix the problem. And what's the problem? The man, he is blind. And he has been blind since birth. Verse 3, Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. I like it the way the NIV puts this particular verse. Neither this man nor his parents sinned. So the answer to the, the disciples' question was no. 
It wasn't because of the man's sin. It wasn't because of the parent's sin. Now, we know from the Word of God, and we know from Scripture and from what God says that we can do things in our lives that do open the door to the enemy. We can do things in our lives that do open the door to sickness and disease. The easiest example is with sexual promiscuity. I mean, if basically you live a life of sexual promiscuity, not according to the Word of God, but just sleep with whomever, do whatever makes you feel good, you're opening the door of your life to sickness and disease, to all those things on the TV commercials where they're, they're selling creams and treatments. That's not something God did to you. That's not something the devil did to you. You opened the door by your own what? Your action. But here the disciples are fishing for an answer. Jesus says, neither this man nor his parents sin, but this happened so that the work of God might be displayed in his life. Everybody say might. I mentioned during the offering 2 Corinthians 9 and verse 11. So that we can be. See, it doesn't say we will be. So that we can be what? Generous. But does that mean that every Christian, every believer is going to be generous? No. So that we can be generous on what? Every what? Occasion. And every, every problem... Every challenge, every difficulty, every, every financial problem, every, every physical problem, every problem of sickness and disease, like an occasion, is an opportunity for the glory of God to be displayed. It is an opportunity for the glory of God to be displayed. And the glory of God can be displayed if we will have ears to hear and we'll take action on the Word of God, if we'll believe if we'll have faith in God, if we'll take action on his word. He said, but this happens so that the work of God might be displayed in his life. Now let me tell you the way religion reads verse 3. Verse 3 is one of the most abused verses in the New Testament, in the Gospels, in the Bible. Because you'll hear people say that God gave them some sickness to bring glory to God. You'll hear people say and talk about, well, some child is suffering of, of a cancer and, and it, God gave it to them to bring glory to God. That is religious nonsense. I've never one time gone to the hospital and thought, man, just look at all the wonderful things that God is doing here. I've never one time seen the, the NICU and walked past the NICU and seen the babies in there facing whatever challenges they're facing and thought, man, isn't this bringing such glory to God? I've never once been in, in Fort Worth where the homeless are and thought, man, their, their poverty, their suffering, it's just bringing such great glory to God. See, that, that's a lie of religion. It is a lie of religion. And see, I have a question for people that head down that road because the man, we're going to see, he gets healed. He's blind, but then he's healed so he can see. So how, are, how is the situation bringing glory to God unless the situation turns around? Unless there's a healing, unless there's a deliverance. People love to talk about Job. They go on and on and on about Job, but they never talk about the end of Job's story. And what was the end? That God blessed him with twice as much two times. You might say, man, Austin, it's been tough. I'm facing it like Job. Well, great. Twice as much is on the way. Amen. See, that I, I'm not going to talk with you for hours and hours and hours about the problem or the challenge. I want to talk about the solution. I want to talk about the answer. See, the Bible says that our help comes from who? The Lord. So if he put something on you to teach you a lesson or to bring glory to himself, well, what are you praying about? You ought to just accept it and live with it because it's from who? The Lord. See, that is a lie of religion. So that the work of God might be what? Displayed in his life. See, when, when a young person, they're lost and they're bound and they're addicted to drugs and they're, they're on their way to hell, that doesn't bring glory to God. What brings glory to God is them getting set free of every addiction, every bondage, and then coming to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. That is what brings glory to God. Sickness does not bring glory to God. It doesn't bring glory to God. Disease doesn't bring glory to God. People suffering in their body 
doesn't bring glory to God. What brings glory to God is them being healed and the situation turning around. Poverty and lack and not enough does not bring glory to God. What brings glory to God is there being plenty and more than enough so that that person can be generous on every occasion. That the work of God might be what? Might be displayed in his life. But see, we have a part to play. I said, we have a part to play. There are people that have you believe, well, it's God doing it to someone. Well, then there's no hope if it's the Lord. That's a lie of religion. And then there's another lie of religion that, well, something good will happen if it's your lucky day. Something good will happen if maybe you were predestined for it or whatever it is. No, no, no. God is not a God of favoritism. He, Jesus, he died that we all might be saved, that we all might be healed, that we all might be blessed, that the work of God might be displayed. Verse 4, as long as it is day, we must do the work of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Verse 6, having said this, he spit on the ground, made some mud with the saliva, and put it on the man's eyes. You might say, well, Austin, why did he do it this way? Jesus did everything he did as led by the Holy Spirit. And Jesus, we know, he was anointed. Amen. Even his spit was anointed. Now, the proof is in the pudding. The proof is in the pudding. The proof is with the fruit. So, you know, there are times in church occasionally people, not here, amen, we don't let weird stuff go on here. I'm just saying in general, <laughs> maybe someone says something weird or does something weird. Look, if, if somebody spits on you and you don't get healed or your need isn't met, that was not God. That was not God. They didn't do that as led by the Lord, amen. This is Jesus, so look, if Jesus... He wanted to apply some spit. Amen, I'm all for it. I want to receive anything that God has for me. I'm not going to doubt it. I'm not going to judge it. I'm not, going to, I'm not going to question it. But this is why in dealing with needs, this is why in dealing with sickness and disease, we have to be led by the Holy Spirit. And sometimes we're not as sensitive to Him as we should be. If you go back and study the healing revival in the 50s and the 60s, many of the great healing evangelists would require people to come to so many services before they would even pray with them. Why? Because the Bible says faith comes by hearing, and hearing by what? Hearing by the Word of God. And so they knew that if somebody had sat through so many services, if somebody had heard the Word of God regarding healing so many times, they would get better results praying with them. And see, we're, Paul said to Timothy, what did Paul say to Timothy about the laying on of hands? He said, young man, Timothy, do not be what? Hasty, quick about the laying on of hands. See, a lot of times we're just doing what we're doing, not stopping to pause and say, Holy Spirit, what do we need to do in this situation? Well, that, that person, they might need to sit in church a while and hear the word of God. Or he might lead us to pray with them in a different way. You know, there's a famous story about Smith Wigglesworth. A man came to a meeting. Smith Wigglesworth was an early Pentecostal revivalist, the beginning of the 20th century, greatly used of God. He was a plumber that got saved and filled with the Holy Spirit. God worked mighty wonders and miracles through him. Man came to his meeting, dying of cancer, stomach cancer. And so Smith Wigglesworth, as led by the Holy Spirit, he, when he got to him in line, he reared back and punched the guy in the stomach. And the guy's condition was so bad, his doctor was with him. He said to Wigglesworth, you killed him. You killed him. But within moments, the man, the man stood up, began rejoicing. He had been completely healed. All the pain was gone. And you might say, Austin, that's crazy. Well, the proof is in the pudding. The proof is with the fruit. Amen. They were to do things as led by the Spirit. And Jesus in his ministry did everything he did as led by the Spirit. He would say, if, if I'm saying it, the Father has told me to say it. It's from the Father. I am the light of the world. Having said this, he spit on the ground, made some mud with the saliva, and put it on the man's eyes. Now what if the man had resisted this? 
What if the man had said, I don't want to be prayed for that way? Just say a word. Or lay your hands on me and bless me like those little children. Would he have received his miracle? See, part of receiving from God is following his instructions and going with what God wants to do and flowing with what God wants to do and not being resistant to it. Smith, or Lester Sumrall. Lester Sumrall, in the last book he wrote before he went to the Lord, went to be with the Lord, he talks about how in every generation there's a move of God and God moves in a particular way. And if you are unwilling to flow with it and move with it, you'll miss out on what God is doing in that particular generation. And he, he then illustrated that through history, that if he had been alive when John Wesley was alive, he would have been a Methodist. It's a fascinating part of his book. If the man had resisted, he wouldn't have received. Verse 7, go, Jesus told him, wash in the pool of Siloam. And the word for Siloam means sin. Go and wash in the pool of Siloam. This is a little, very similar to the story in the Old Testament where Naaman is told to go wash in a dirty river seven times. Jesus gives particular instructions, go wash in the pool of Siloam. So the man went and washed, and what does it say? He came home what? Sing. He went and he washed and he came home sing. Last week we saw in Luke's gospel that Jesus in faith, speaking by faith, told the 10 lepers, they came to Jesus needing healing for leprosy. He told them to go show themselves to the priest. Well, you would only go do that if you had been healed. So Jesus was speaking by faith, declaring that they were healed and that they were now to go show themselves to the priest to confirm it. And it says in Luke's gospel that as they went, they were cleansed. As they went, as they took action, as they obeyed, as they did what Jesus said do, they were cleansed, they were healed, they were perfectly made whole. We could say it this way, as they followed instructions. Jesus said to the man born blind, go wash in the pool of Siloam. So the man went and washed and he came home saying, he was healed because he did what Jesus said do. He was healed because he obeyed the Son of God. He, he was healed because he obeyed the instructions that the Word of God gave him. That's why he was healed. And th this is a big issue in our culture today. You've got to bring your life under submission to God and in His Word. You've got to begin doing what the Word says do, because if you don't, you will not walk in the fullness of everything that God has for you. He said to him, go, wash. And the man went and washed, and he came home, sing. He came home, sing. Verse 8, his neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging asked, isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? See, their time, their day was not like our culture today, where we have all this technology, where if someone they can't see or they're disabled in some way, they can still work, they can still use a computer, they can still make a living. In, in their day, in the first century, in Jesus' day, if you were a leper, you couldn't work for a living. If you were lame, if you were crippled, you couldn't work for a living. If you were like this man, born blind, you couldn't work for a living, which made you a beggar. But God doesn't want anyone to stay a beggar. God doesn't want anyone to stay in the situation where they're at. God doesn't want anyone who's sick to stay sick. God doesn't want anyone who's lost to stay lost and unsaved. God doesn't want anyone who doesn't have not enough to continue living with not enough year after year. He doesn't want any of us to remain beggars. He wants us to be healed. He wants us to be delivered. He wants us to be blessed. He wants us to come out of the situation. And so Jesus healed this man, and he was healed as he did what Jesus said do. And the result was, he was a beggar, but he wasn't going to have to be a beggar anymore because of what had happened, because of his obedience, because of what Jesus had done. He wasn't going to have to be a beggar anymore. But see, religion wants to keep you a beggar. Religion wants to keep you in the same situation year after year. 
That's why religion will lie to people and tell them their sin isn't sin. Why? So they'll stay in the same situation. So their life will be defeated year after year. So they'll never step into the fullness of everything God has for them. That's why religion will tell people and lie to them that, that God delights when they don't have enough. God delights when their, their, their financial needs aren't met because religion wants to keep people where they're at. But that is not the good news of the gospel. Go back to Luke 4 when Jesus came and he said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to do what? To preach what? Good news to the poor. Well, how is it good news if the message is you are poor, you are a beggar, you will be a beggar till the day you die? See, how is that good news to the poor? Deliverance for the captives? How is it good news for the captives if the answer, the response is you're going to be a captive and you're going to struggle and you're going to be bound by that and addicted to that till the day you die? See, that's not good news. That's not good news. So isn't this the man who used to sit and beg? Some claim that he was. Others said, no, he only looks like him. But he himself insisted, I am the man. How then were your eyes open, they demanded. So they, they wanted to know. He replied, the man they called Jesus made some mud and put it on my eyes. He told me to go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and then I could see. So notice, he was not healed. The manifestation of his healing was not done and complete until he had fully obeyed the Lord's instructions. So I went and washed and then I could see. I ended the message last week saying to everyone, be sensitive to whatever God is putting on your heart. Have ears to hear what God is saying to you. In our lives, is there, as we approach the end of this year, in our lives, is there some unfinished business? Are there some things in our lives that God has been dealing with us about all year that we have not yet done? Maybe it's going to someone and asking their forgiveness. Maybe it's something in your life God has been dealing with you about again and again and again, and you've not dealt with it. You've not handled it. You've not gotten that out of your life. You've not gotten that friendship out of your life. You've not stopped doing something that he has convicted you about. Or maybe it's something that the Lord has put on your heart again and again to do, and you've not done it. He said to them, so I went and washed, and then I could see. See, when we do our part, God does his part. There are a lot of Christians, and they're they're praying and they're asking God to bless them and increase them, but they're not doing what the Word says do. They're not following the written instructions that we already have, which is to what? To not rob God, to bring the whole tithe into his storehouse that there may be food in his house. Test me in this, says the Lord, and see if I will not throw open the windows of heaven and pour out so much blessing you can't contain it. Now think about it. Do I need to fast to see the windows of heaven open in my life financially? Do I need to have 48 hours of prayer to see the windows of heaven open? I just need to do one thing, and what is that according to the word? Tithe. And you have people, and they'll do all sorts of things. They'll try this and that, and they simply won't bring themselves to do what the word says do, what Jesus says do. And think about this man. What if he said, no, don't put that, don't put that mixture of clay and spit on my eyes? Or Jesus said, go and wash in the pool of Siloam. What if he said, well, you know, that's further away. There's this other pool that's closer. What if, what if I go there instead? See, he would have missed out on his healing. We have to be able to follow instructions. And the instructions we ought to be following are the instructions we have here in the Word of God. And this is a big deal for us in the culture we live in today because we live in a culture of rebellion. We live in a culture where young people beginning in school have been taught moral relativism, that whatever you want to believe is okay, and that your opinion is as equally valid as any other opinion. I mean, they just named General Mad Dog Matisse to be in a high position to be the new Secretary of Defense once he's confirmed. Well, that would be like me meeting him at Starbucks and Austin telling General Mad Dog Matisse that Austin knows more about warfare. My opinion is not equally valid to his opinion. 
But we live in a culture where people have been taught everybody's opinion is equal and is valid, and you can just believe whatever you want to believe. And that's why people are more messed up than ever. That's why people are more messed up than ever. I mean, what does the Bible say about sex and marriage? One man, one woman being what? Joined together. Not one man and another man, not one woman and another woman. It's clear. But see, as long as people are trying to do their own thing, they'll miss out on what God has for them. Well, you know, Austin, I, I just, financially, I just don't believe I need to be generous. Great. You're going to stay where you're at. Your, your, your situation is not going to change. God is not going to step in and do a mighty work and a mighty miracle until you begin doing what his word says do. He went and washed and then he could see. See, it's our, our not following instructions that robs us of the blessings of God. This man followed instructions like the lepers as he went, as he obeyed, as he did what Jesus said do. So I went and washed, and then I could see. Where is this man? They asked him of Jesus. I don't know, he said. And we'll get to it next Sunday. I, I love what it says. What he says in verse 25 to the religious leaders, he says, I was blind, but now I can see. So you might say, well, Austin, this is new to me. I, I've been taught God wants me to stay where I'm at. I've been taught that if, if I've got this physical challenge, I'm going to have this physical challenge till the day I die. I've been taught that if I'm in need, I'm going to be in need, that that's just the will of God for my life. All of that is a lie. God wants you to be able to say like that, man, I was blind, but now I can see. I was lost. I was on my way to hell, but now I'm on my way to heaven. I was lost but now I have been found. I was sick in my body. I did have that physical challenge. I did have that disease, but I have been healed. I don't have it anymore. I was poor, but now I'm blessed. I was poor, but now I'm rich. I was poor, but now I can be generous on every occasion. That is the will of God for your life. That's his will. But you have to have eyes to see it from his word. He doesn't want your situation to remain the same. Today, December 4th, 2016, this Sunday next year, you ought to be light years beyond where you are right now. All you have to do is believe God, believe his word, and take action on his word. And he is good. He is gracious. He is merciful. You will see his hand at work in your life in such awesome and wonderful ways. And you'll see his goodness. You'll see his mercy. You'll see him work and bring about mighty provision even faster than you can believe. That is the goodness of God. I was blind, but now I can see. Amen. That's what God does. See, religion will tell you it's got to stay the same. People will tell you it's got to stay the same. But that's not what God says. Okay, there's this challenge. Okay, there's this difficulty. Okay, we weren't expecting it. But instead of talking about it, let's just say this is another opportunity to prove that the Word of God is true. Let's just say this is just another opportunity for the glory of God to be revealed. Not by you staying messed up, but by the situation turning around. Not by you remaining sick, but by you being healed. Not by you remaining in this need, but by that need being met. Amen. This is an opportunity that the work of God might be displayed in your life. Amen. So do not, don't be discouraged. You might say, Austin, you don't know about what I'm facing. You don't know about what I've been praying about. You don't know about the need of my life. The Lord does. This is an opportunity for God to do something great in your life. This is an opportunity for the glory of God to be displayed in your life. This is an opportunity for God to show his goodness in your life. Not just now, not just in the remainder of this year, but in 2017. Amen. And follow his instructions. This time of year, I believe it is so important that as we head toward the end of the year, 
we do anything God puts on our heart. We make right anything he's been dealing with us about. It might be someone you need to go and ask their forgiveness. Let's do whatever he puts on our heart to do. Amen. And then like that man who was blind, but then he could see, like him, you'll be able to say, I went and I did. And then God's mighty glory was displayed in my life. I went and then I did and I was healed. I was blessed. The situation turned around. Amen. Please bow your heads. You might be here today and perhaps you have never heard about the goodness of God like this. That he wants you to be saved. He wants you to be healed. He wants you to be blessed. That he has a good plan for your life. That he wants to do an awesome work in your life. All of it begins by accepting his son, Jesus, as the Lord and the Savior of your life. The world, the culture, it'll lie to you and it'll tell you that you can just believe whatever you want. You can just do whatever you want. That there are, there are many paths to God. That's a lie. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. You'll only find salvation. You'll only find life. You'll only find God by giving your life to his son, Jesus Christ. If you're here today, you just say, Austin, I've never done that, but I know I need to. I want to make Jesus my Lord and Savior. I want to give him my life. If that's you this morning, heads are bowed, eyes are closed. This is between you, me, and God. If you would, raise your hand. I want to pray with you. If you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, but you want to, raise your hand this morning. You might also be here today, and at one point in your life, you prayed a prayer. You, you walked an aisle, but you know in your heart, you've not been living for God. You know in your heart, you're not right with God. You know in your heart, you, you've drifted from Him, whatever the reason. Holy Spirit has been convicting you this morning. God is merciful. And the Bible says that his mercies are new every morning. And so what is today? It is an occasion. It is an opportunity to come home like the prodigal and say, I missed it. I messed up. I I drifted away. But to come home. And if you do, you'll find grace. You'll find mercy. You'll find a new beginning. You'll find a fresh start. The Bible says that if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If you're here today and say, Austin, I need to do that. I need to recommit my life. If that's you, please raise your hand. For the sake of those that raise their hands, we're going to pray. Repeat this prayer after me, and let's do that together as a show of support for those that have raised their hands. Say this prayer after me. Heavenly Father, I repent of my sins. I believe that your Son that he lived for me, that he died for me, that I could be forgiven of my sins. And I believe that you raised him from the dead. Today I make Jesus my Lord and my Savior. From this day forward, I will live for you. I will obey your word. I will be in your house. And I will live for you. Thank you for doing a mighty work in my life. Thank you for saving me and for adopting me into your family. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God, he is good. Don't ever see something going on in someone's life whether a physical challenge or a financial challenge and and waste any time talking about why, the cause, pray for them. And then begin to say and encourage them. Like that blind man, doesn't matter the situation. With God, all things are possible and it can be turned around that the work of God, the glory of God might be displayed in their life. Amen, amen.